Hey everyone, the Classic DM, and I've got a new series for you. It's called First Edition AD&D for New Players. The magic of the original game and how to get playing. You know, the inspiration for this came from the other day. We had a little company get-together of folks having some Thanksgiving food and hanging out. And a number of the players, uh, people in my studio, they uh, play 5th Edition. There's maybe like five or six of them. And they're young folks, maybe in their mid-20s, early 30s. And uh, I'm old school, so... We were talking about their campaign and what they've been playing. We've talked about their campaign all the time. And one of the fellows who just started recently was talking about how he just absolutely loves 5th edition. He's talking about his cleric build that he has. It was really fun. And I showed him my uh, YouTube channel. He's like, holy crap, this is awesome. He, and he said, what edition is that? And I said, oh, it's 1st edition. Have you ever played it? He says, no, I never have. I never really knew how to get into it or anything. I mean, everyone's just playing 5th edition all the time. I was like, you know what? There's so much magic in the 1st edition. It's so simple to play. It has so much basic core RPG elements to it that are just so classic and it's not and you sure this it's 40 years later I mean this thing came out and I got my first player's handbook at 40 years ago almost to the week um, wait that what was that what, way back in 1978 or something that's crazy so it's not just the nostalgia of the game it's how basic the mechanics were this was a time frame where uh, Traveler came out at the same time, a game that came from Mark Miller and Game Designers Workshop. They really touched and grabbed a hold of the uh, classic tactical combat vibe from wargaming and translated it into um, hard science fiction. Um, it wasn't the space opera that you see in Star Wars. And D&D kind of came from the same um, epoch of early days of publishing. We always hear about the little black books of Traveler. Well, D&D &D got started the same way with little bound, you know, staple bound little booklets. And uh, But once it got to the basic edition and then to the first edition, that's where the game in 1970, I think, really, really hit mainstream with the first set of published core rule books. So in the modern day, you can get those rule books, but you got to get them off of eBay. And if you try to get them at some used bookstore, they're really overpriced. They're a collector's item now. I mean, it's like trying to buy a muscle car. These things are collector's items. But all is not lost. So let's go through this first episode of what do you really need to get started and how much money you need to spend? Because you don't really need to spend that much. And then maybe the next episode we'll talk about making characters and some flexibility, how you make the characters, how the core stats work. We'll talk about the different classes, what makes the first edition classes so amazing. Because if you play fifth edition or you play Pathfinder or 3.0, you know, there's no skills. There's all kinds of nuances and things about first edition. They're really pure and clean. They give the DM a lot of freedom. And I think that's some of the magic of the original game. It, everything's not all scoped out for you. And like I mentioned earlier, the young coworker who I work with was saying like, yeah, I never really played any of the store-bought adventures. We always play a homebrew campaign because I really like all the story. And uh, he's DM some stuff and he's got a buddy that plays with it, uh, the DMs. They played over the web with oh, Roll20, which is one of the software packages, which is a really modern way for people to play. But let's get back on topic here. Let's talk about what do you need to get playing. So the first thing let's do is let's pop up this uh, screen here and give you a sense of uh, what you're going to need to get playing. We'll get rid of this webcam. We don't need to see this yet. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's get this player info up for you. And uh, here we go. Let's get this going here. Okay, so one of the very first things you're going to need to do anything is you need to figure out where am I going to go to uh, where am I going to go to get this stuff. Well, it used to be RPG uh, now or drive through RPG. They kind of merged and and formed a alliance or business relationship with the Wizards of the Coast for the 5th edition. So around 2014, they kind of created this Dungeon Masters Guild, and it's pretty straightforward, just website. It's a way for you to make your own content for 5th edition using the OGL, which is Open Game License, and you can get all kinds of great books and adventures and all kinds of rules. But what you want to do, this is a good place to get the stuff, because you're going to get PDF copies of the original books for $10 each. And these books, even back in the old days, they cost $20. In a modern-day 5th edition book, I mean, you're paying $39, $49. I mean, if you want to get into D&D today, you better have 250 bucks sitting aside. And you're going to be wishing you had $2,000 to spend. So it's not really about how expensive it is, because it doesn't matter, because new, modern, published content is always great. But go to the Dungeon Masters Guild website, have fun looking at all the cool stuff. But just go over here this left side, the content side. If you just collapse all these things, first of all, just go to content, and then go, I want classic stuff. So click on that, and uh, this is where you're going to dig around in lots of old business. So it's going to bring up a hodgepodge of random algorithm junk. <laughs> some of it's great, some of it's homebrew, some of it's cheap, some of it's five stars, some of it has no rating, some of it's really, really old. Um, but what you kind of want to do next is say, okay, what are you looking for? Let's go to product type. What you're looking for is core rules. So this is going to get you classics, core rules. 
Well, you start to see a little bit of some of the old stuff here, but you're getting some 3.0. I mean, even right off the bat here, you're seeing the Player's Handbook from 4th Edition. That's from 2007. Right next to the Player's Handbook reprint from, I think it was 2013. Now, you can't get the original, original, original Player's Handbook anymore. I was able to get it years ago at Drive-Thru RPG. I just was able to scan my old Fiend folio and make a PDF version for my own personal use. So what you really want to do here is uh, say, well, okay, what kind of edition are we looking for? So you can go down here to the Edition tab and say, listen, I want First Edition. So once you click on that, you're starting to filter down to a little bit what you're looking for. All right. So here you go. So in 2013, I actually remember some of the fellows who worked at CCP in Atlanta, which is the guys who make EVE Online. Some of the guys that worked there were working on some of this stuff. They took some of the original core books, the original Player's Handbook, the original Dungeon Master's Guide, and the original Monster Manual, and they kind of reprinted them. But So you can get these are PDF copies of this. And of course, the Dungeon Master's Guild does offer a print-on-demand feature, but that's going to cost you a little bit, okay? So you can see, you see right here. You can get a watermark PDF for $9.99, hard buck color, standard heavyweights, $24.99. And for, you know, it just gets higher and higher. So if you really, really want a reprinted version of this thing, print on demand with premium heavyweight, you're going to spend $35. I don't suggest you do that. I suggest what you do is if you already play 5th edition or you played 4th edition, just dabbled in 5th, or if you're a traveler player or you played something else or you just want to play D&D for the first time ever, this is I recommend just grabbing the PDF. So... This is a great place to do that. Well, which books do you want to get? Well, obviously, there's so much stuff. I mean, if you remember any of the Facebook groups, you'll have entire threads. Everyone talk about the world of Greyhawk. I mean, the world of Greyhawk. Hey, look at that, four ninety nine. It's like nothing. You can't even eat fast food these days for four ninety nine. This is an absolute must have. The For Forgotten Realms campaign set. I think it's brilliant too. Um, those were originally created right around the mid to late eighties and early nineties. Um, primarily with Ed Greenwood and some other designers that went to the coast right after TSR was purchased. The thing was the majority of the content in the Forgotten Realms really kind of got its kickstart from the fact that they started publishing novels. So Dragonlance was one of the first big series of novels. They're really fun to read. They're kind of like a Lord of the Rings with D&D rule sets. Uh, really great storylines, like 10, 20 novels of those. And then obviously, you know, the Dred Stewart and stuff started off with the Crystal Shard and R.A. Salvatore's knowledge uh, novels. His whole career got kicked off by writing D&D books at the Forgotten Realms. That's why you have Wolfgar and Bruner Battlehammer and Caddy Bree and all those characters and all the spin-off games that have happened over the years. And he must have done 50 novels by now. But his first one, which is the Crystal Shard, where he kind of pitched the idea of this Dred Stewart character, um, allowed him to expand upon the northern section of the Forgotten Realms, which is where the Spine of the World is and the Ten Towns and all that cool lore. So, you know, if you read some of the other books, there's books about where the gods are walking the earth and all those old cool novels. You can probably pick them up for cheap um, in a used bookstore somewhere. If you really want to dig into D&D and have some fun, some of those novels are great because the characters are memorable. Um, so those are all set pretty much in the Forgotten Realms. So there's a guidebook that will give you an atlas of it, and you can find out, like, where did Dritz Duerden and Wolfgar go when they went through the troll fins and where this one battle happened when they fought these ogres. And so it's kind of fun. So it's kind of like having a movie come alive in your imagination. So if you really, really, really love that kind of stuff, you like to read a novel and then go play in a campaign that has the same exact location, like you love Waterdeep or you love Neverwinter and all that kind of stuff, I should definitely suggest you spend 10 bucks and get the Forgotten Realms campaign set that I've got the mouse cursor over right here. Um, the uh, four reviews, you got to be kidding me, it should be four million reviews. The World of Greyhawk is just the absolute classic of classic. This is because it's the most beautiful map ever created, and it was won by the TSR original uh, artist. It was a woman named Darlene, was her name? Darlene Peckle, I think was the original name. And her map that she made was brilliant. This was Gary Gygax's campaign setting. But TSR, they got purchased by Wizards of the Coast relatively quickly, and uh, the World of Greyhawk really never got its legs. But what it did do was establish a core campaign that we're playing through on our channel, which is against the Giants, G1, 2, and 3, and then we're going to do the Descent to the Depths of the Earth, the Shrine of Kuto Kuatoa, and the Vault of the Drow. And that's where the first setting of the Drow ever came from. So let's get back to books, right? We're getting off in a tangent a little bit. But what you need to think about here is this first line right here, everything on this first line, these are all got to have it except on Earth Arcana. I don't recommend that at all. I think it's just kind of a fluff item. So if you love novels, you love story, you want to read a book and you want to play in a world and you've got plenty of games and plenty of multimedia and plenty of reference and second edition and third edition content, Forgotten Realms is a fantastic setting 
really, really great. If you want the really old, die-hard, crunchy around the edges, nasty campaign stuff like I've been running, like you can see the Glacial Rift of the Frost Giant Jarl, it's like a seven-page, eight-page module, you want the World of Greyhawk. You should just get both anyway, right? So let's get this out of the way. So now you know which website to go to. You can see these things are like $9.99, super cheap. You can get those things. Once you have them purchased once, you have them forever. So once you have these things done, you know, you can go back and re-download them. Like I have my classic traveler stuff in here and DM Guild Creator Resource and Scrivener stuff and all these kinds of things. I have multiple accounts um, for this stuff. So you have this library forever. So you can put it in your Dropbox and re-download it if you lose a copy of it. So let's talk about the books themselves. And I think what we're going to do first, let's just start with the classic. you got to have this. And I'm going to adjust this panel real quick and we're going to pull the screen up in the background for the little dungeon. We're going to talk about some of this stuff. Here we go. So this is the infamous player's handbook with a goofy art that's on there. Now, you should get this book first. If you're going to buy anything, buy this book. And I know it sounds like a homework assignment, but just the first day you get it, you know, the first day you get it, just start going through this and read the first essay by Gary Gygax. Just read that first essay, and it tells you about the spirit of the game, what it's all about. Read the first few chapters about the introduction and how the game's played. Some of it's going to make sense to you if you've already played the game. Some of it's going to be uh, um, thematic. It may put you to sleep. <laughs> but if you want to get into it, you want to create a character right away, you want to start reading through this section here. And for this episode, I want to talk real briefly about these core stats because all these things are different. So um, you basically have strength. Let's pull, you know what I'll do? I'll tell you, let's pull up a character sheet too. So here's a character sheet from our... Uh, let's put let's put Varenjar up here. He's nasty. Where is he at? There he is. So here's a Varenjar. Let's just slide this over a little bit. This is a custom character sheet I made from scratch. So I just made it in PowerPoint. So this is what it looks like when it's empty. And then I can put my own pictures of whatever character I wanted to have in there. And you have the core statistics. So it's basically, let's just start here with until you have strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, and charisma. Then you have saving throws down here. And then all your damage numbers you want to put in, your armor class, your hit points, your movement rate, your to hit armor class zero, which is a good reference thing, your character name. And you put some spells on there or whatever. So this is the thing about their game that's always lived on forever. The whole statistics have never changed. And if you play some other role-playing games, you'll find that sometimes the statistics numbers will change. So they call them the ability scores. So the first edition, they break down the ability scores in one of the most simplistic ways possible. You know, they just tell you what the ability does. But you don't have a lot of modifiers. Um, you don't have um, too much to worry about. So... You have things like, uh, you know, if you have a, your strength is a certain number, you may get a bonus to hit. This is this column here, this hit probability column. That's, we can't highlight that. This hit probability column, then you have a damage adjustment. This is how much bonus damage you do because of your strength. And once you hit 18 strength, it gets subdivided into percentile rolls, right? So when you get to giant strength, it gets away over 19 and 20 and even higher. So I tell you what, let's do Let's just pop in a little closer on this one. We'll just pop this in about 100% here so you can see a little bit better. So when you roll the strength table, they have a little description kind of tell you how much this strength is, the maximum strength possible for a female gnome character. Those things don't really, really make that much of a difference when you're playing. When you're trying to roll a character, you kind of want to make sure they have the right statistics and everything. You'll find a point that the first time you try making a character, like, oh, wow, an illusionist. I really want to make an illusionist. Oh, gee whiz, they need to have 16 in dexterity. I don't have that. So let's just flip through the, the stats first, and we'll talk about when you're rolling the character up. The second table is intelligence, and once again, they gave you a, you're rolling 3d6 as the core way to do this. Some people used to do roll 4d6, take the best three. Some people give you a pool of numbers. Um, they total up, they take, you know, they take 18, they multiply it times six, and they subtract 18 from it, and give you a pool that you can pull from. You can just distribute them, like if you ever played Baldur's Gate or Icewind Dale, the electronic games. Um, from Black Isle or Neverwinter. A lot of times they allow you just to pick and choose the statistics yourself. But no matter how you determine, you know, you can just ask millions of people on Facebook, how do you guys like to do character creation? So uh, for me, my personal way of doing it is I have someone that says they want to make a character, right? Oh, and they tell me which class they want to make. And so I'll give them the core basic stats and I'll give them like roll 2d6 and those are the extra numbers you can move around. And so you get some epic characters that way. So you get a character kind of like um, I don't know, let's take a look at Obscura. She's pretty crazy. Let's just take a look at her real quick. So this is a pretty badass illusionist, wouldn't you say? I mean, she's, but she's, you know, you will make an illusionist. She, all these meet her minimum requirements. She had enough dexterity. This is an old character sheet, so she didn't have enough dexterity. And let's just pull up, uh, let's pull up 
let's pull up a warrior Mercedes. Okay. Six, 16 strength, 16 intelligence, 14 wisdom, 15 dex, 15 con, 17 charisma. You could probably roll 46 for three weeks and never have those numbers roll up. And then that's just a personal preference. If you're going to play a character, it's going to be a massive campaign. It's going to be something you play for seven, eight, nine, ten years. Um, there's no character stat increases over time. So if you ever played Neverwinter or played third edition, um, third 3.5 you get situations where, oh, you hit level 8, you can now add a point to any of your ability scores. That doesn't happen in first edition. So whatever you start off with, unless you get a disease or get level drained or something by a vampire, it ends up being your stats forever. So why gimp yourself? Now, you don't want to give yourself straight 18s, so a lot of times what I'll do is say, okay, well, you're going to make a class that has a specific number of statistics you need to have just to even be the class, like an assassin, let me give you the bare minimum, and I'll give you a few numbers you can add here or there. So in this situation, the player wanted to add a lot of strength and have pretty decent decks at 17 and pretty good constitution, but they're willing to sacrifice their wisdom and their charisma. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. I mean, you want the person to have a hero. You want the person playing the character to have a heroic character. Um, who wants to play an assassin that can that has 14 dexterity and everything else has nines? You know, I mean, if you're playing Traveler, you might die in character creation. So the way you do the characters is up to you. I like people to have fun, and I want them to play the character and love the character like it's a movie character or a character from a film. So with Intelligence, they have things like chance to know each listed spell. This is a, a thing I never used. I mean, when I first started playing, it was when I was 13 years old, so that was like over 40 years ago. You know, we never really did the rule system exactly verbatim. We changed some things to make it more fun. So in this situation, you know, magic users, they would memorize spells, and based upon your intelligence, you would have a list of spells on your spell list, and then there'd be a chance you wouldn't be able to know one of them. So it's like, why is it on the list? <laughs> so you have this list, like, yeah, I want to learn Magic Missile. Yeah, dude, it's awesome. I have a 13 intelligence. I only have a 55% chance to know it, which seemed kind of counterproductive. I mean, if you're a ma if you're magician, magic user, wizard, or whatever your title is, and you took the time to learn the magical spell, were instructed how to do it, you practiced it at the arcane college or whatever you did, uh, odds are you kind of know how to do it. It's like someone saying your percentage chance to know your name of the state that you live in. But, you know, there was two other values, which is the minimum number of spells per level and the maximum number of spells. For those players, when we played, the max number of spells level was pretty good. You wanted to have a high uh, intelligence number, so you could be like, well, you know what, this, my character's got 15 intelligence, I only get 11 spells per level, and, and my buddy here is 18, he can get 14. So when you get ready to pick your spells and how many you get, there's a table you refer to later on with a class that tells you how many you get, but there'd be a min and a max. So that was pretty useful. Um, so you're starting to get the vibe here for first edition, how clean and simple it is. Wisdom's the same thing. There'd be a table that tells you, hey, this is, this is the minimum wisdom for a ranger, all right, 14. And then you go down to the table, there'd be an adjustment, but it's just for clerics. So clerics would have a percentage chance of spell failure, and they'd, but they'd have a spell bonus. This is another rule that I think you should ignore. I think that the chance for spell failure is kind of silly. Um, I always like the Dark Age of Camelot kind of method. If you get melee struck while casting a spell, um, there's a percentage chance you'll be interrupted, roll your wisdom score or less and, uh, on a d20. Since the max number you could have for wisdom would be 18, you'd already had a 10% deficiency right off the bat. If you have 14 wisdom, that means if you roll a 12 or 11 or a 9 or a 14 equal, then you, can't, you get the spell off. Or maybe you could do a dexterity check. And that's one thing I'm a big fan of is ability score checks as opposed to a skill check. So first edition doesn't have skills. You don't have spot and listen and heal and all that kind of business. Um, you don't have self-healing abilities. It's very hardcore. But the ability scores are there for you to do what you want to do with it. And doing checks like that is a good way to handle those kinds of rules. When you're first making a character, say you make a cleric or a druid, you're going to see that, hey, the higher your wisdom is, you might get an extra spell, like one bonus third level spell. Uh, it helps a little bit, not a lot. On the same page, you get into dexterity, where this funny little picture comes from here. Um, it starts talking about what your dexterity does. Dexterity has a pretty big impact in first edition. Um, the table at the top is really just for thieves, so the higher the dexterity score you have, they're going to have bonuses to their pickpockets and open locks and locating your moving traps and move silently and hide in shadows. I always thought it was kind of funny how that um, locating uh, traps was, you know, you could get a bonus, an insignificant bonus based on your dexterity. Like, why even list it? You'd have to have 18 dexterity for it to even do anything. But that's that's good. That's useful. But the, uh, the, the one that was really important here is... Um, 
this reaction attacking adjustment. So the defensive adjustment and the reaction attacking adjustment. Now in 2.5 and 3.0, these rules got trickier. So you couldn't wear like a cloaker protection and a ring of protection and have a dex bonus and have the offhand shield bonus and all this kind of business. What we would do this is listen, your dexterity is kind of controls your mastery of your hand-eye coordination, your agility, your balance, um, how coordinated you are, how you're able to duck and dodge and move out of the way, how you're able to control your body in combat when you wear armor. So we use the defensive adjustment, judge, adjustment to lower your armor class. Because in first edition, the armor class numbers go from 10, which is wearing nothing, to zero, which is like wearing full plate mail plus a shield plus a magic item or two. I think full plate mail and a shield is like armor class two, all the way to negative 10, which is like something you have in Demi-Gorgon or a demon. So if you have armor class like four, like wearing chain mail and a shield or something, a defensive adjustment from 17 dexterity to minus three, that's pretty nice. That puts you down to armor class one. So with everything being based on a D20, every number of the D20 dies almost essentially a 5% bonus. So minus three to your armor class is like a 15% increase in your armor class, making you 15% harder to hit. So that's really useful. Now the reaction attacking adjustment, this is really used for initiative die rolls. You see me in the game sessions, I'll roll for initiative. I'll, sometimes I'll do a group initiative and I don't include this. But if I have a situation where, hey, it's just Vrenjar 101 against an ogre, the ogre sees him, he sees him, they see each other, they're both, flat, they're both aware of each other, no one's surprised or looking the wrong way. Whoever wins initiative kind of is able to react quicker and get their first attack off because you can't have people attacking simultaneously. So that's kind of what that number's for. And you have to make sure that appears on a character sheet. Like for us, look at the Vrenjar again, right? So he has 17 dexterity, so he has plus two reaction attack adjustment. So if we were to roll initiative roll for him, and we roll a 12, you plus add plus two to that, make it 14. If you try to beat someone else, they roll 13 natural and had no bonus, he's gonna beat them. That means he gets to attack first. His armor class is negative two. Well, with the armor that he's wearing, um, that negative two makes a big difference. Um, that lowers his armor class three. So his armor class would be one otherwise. So in this, in first edition, you want the lowest number possible. You don't want the highest number. There's no attack bonus number. In, uh, th in third edition, especially if you play Never or Nights, you know what it's like. There's an attack bonus, and then there's a armor class, and they get really high. You have like plus 78 attack bonus and 89 armor. It gets kind of out of control. First edition's easy. 10 means you're wearing nothing. Two is plate mail and shield. Negative 10, you're basically like demon armor. Um, I think you didn't miss anything there. Yes, yeah, so that's pretty much that for dexterity. Then you go down to the adjustment for thieves, what I mentioned in Constitution. There were some rules that were kind of interesting in Constitution that we don't really use much um, when we played. And I don't really think you need to pay too much attention to it, but the one I would pay attention to is called hit point adjustment. And that's this first entry on the column here. So in the, in the basic game, you know, every character class has an, a die, a polyhedral dice they roll for their armor, for their hit points. So fighters get to roll a d10, rangers get to roll a d8, thieves get to roll a d6. And say you're a level 10 thief, right? And you roll 10 d6s and they're all averages of three. That means you have 30 health, okay? It's really, really low. What I do with my players is you let max your health. And if you have a constitution bonus, then add that to it. So an example where, um, you know, let's take a look at Varenjar. Here's an example, okay? And some guys disagree with this, but hey, this is my game. I'm going to do what I want to do. I want to do it to make it fun. This is an epic hero. So see his constitution number? That's this one right here. So you have charisma, constitution, body. He has plus two hit point adjustment. So he's level 10 back in this days. He's level 11 now. So 10 times 6 would be 60. We have plus two bonus on every single one of those. Another 20 gives him 80 health. So that means I can also max all the health of my enemy monsters. I like to do it that way. It's kind of MMO-ish a little bit. Um, so I know if I'm fighting a 10 hit dice monster that he's going to have 80 health because one hit die in the first edition D&D is a D8. Now sometimes in a monster manager you'll see later, you'll see like, oh, it's eight. It's hit dice 8 to 1 plus 1 to 4, meaning that it's like plus 1 to 4. It could be hit dice 9, hit dice 10. It's kind of tricky. Um, by maxing health on characters and maxing health on monsters, the fights are longer. Um, there's less fluky, weird statistics wonkiness. Um, you're not going to have as much player death happening. Combat will last longer. Players will get the opportunity to reposition themselves. They'll get chances to flee. They'll survive attacks of opportunity. No one will get one-shotted. Um, it'll feel like a combat fight between heroic characters and heroic enemies. And I think that's what you want to have happen. I think when players are in combat, they should be thinking, what can I do to dispatch this enemy to get on to the next one? They shouldn't be thinking like, I I'm just staying in the back because I only have 12 health. I'm a level, f I'm a level 20 mage with 12 health, okay? It's actually possible. So 
you know, that's something I recommend you do. So when you look at this constitution number, the hit point adjustment number is really critical. Uh, and I think you should honor that. The system shock survival and resurrection survival, this is another rule that's kind of strange from the first edition. It's dealing with, as you can see, the little artwork from the right there showing two clerics trying to resurrect someone from death. How you like to handle death in your game as you're on, whether it's raised dead or resurrections. If you play Baldur's Gate, you know you can carry your body to a temple and pay a bunch of gold and have someone resurrected. I mean, death is a tricky mechanic in every single computer game and every single role-playing game. Like I mentioned earlier, Traveler, you can die during character creation before you even get your character on the scene yet. Um, because those characters aren't 18-year-olds. They're, you know, you could be, you're in the military service for 10, 10, 10 you know, uh, years or 20 years or so before you're released into the wild. You already got money and stuff, so... I don't really think you need to honor this too much. Um, who wants to have a character that you play for five years and have them accidentally die and go to a temple and have them get resurrected and do that whole role-playing scenario and have them roll a percentile die and have them be a low constitution thief with 12 constitution and roll an 86? <laughs> because technically that means you're dead forever. So it, it, that's okay for playing Panzer Leader or Squad Leader or Waterloo or any of the Avalon Hill and you want to kill that one tank and there's other 75 tanks in your back pocket and you're playing Stalingrad or something. But for, I mean, it does make death fearful. But the combination of that with the rando bell curvy type statistical low hit points, it just, it would make the game fluky. I know it's not even really a real word, but it would make it where less fun happens. And I think the fun really happens in the first edition by the playing of the characters and the combat and what happens and being a hero. It doesn't mean being overpowered because you're going to boost the enemies the same. Let's move down to the next step, Charisma. Charisma was one of the most underutilized statistics in the game in first edition, but I used it a lot for leadership checks. Um, Charisma is, and this is like the maximum number of henchmen you can have. You know, when you're first starting out, the odds of you ever even caring about or, ri or paying for or having henchmen is like next to nothing. But they had mechanics in the game, and they did this in EverQuest 2, actually years later, where you could rent henchmen to help you, which is like a sergeant in arms or a guy in plate mail that you meet in a tavern. I think the original idea carry over from the chainmail days was that that was going to be really neat that the players would go into a dungeon and they'd have all these shady henchmen like an in indiana jones in the temple of doom or something and they'd be helping you out but their morale might break and they might backstab you but that's not fun what as was fun for us in our group was having heroic characters and we never hired henchmen but we might bump into other high level npcs and this happens a lot a lot of the adventures like even in the steading of the hill giant chief there's a high level dwarf there's a high level elf fighter magic user that you can meet and if you help them they join your party and charisma is kind of like a good description of your personality, your persuasiveness. It's not just how if you're considered beautiful or anything like that. It's really about the overall pr demeanor of the character. Are they inspirational? Okay, here's a silly thing to say. I think you know Barack Obama probably has a 16 or 17 charisma. <laughs> uh, maybe another president has a much lower charisma. We won't say his name. So, but charisma is kind of like a leadership skill and things like that. So when you're playing the game, and you there are situations in one of our first seasons where. Um, our druid, Felcherna, uh, was having an argument with Mercedes. And Felcherna has 15 charisma. And Mercedes, she's down here. Let's get her up real quick. Where is she at? There's Elephanisi. There she is. And, and uh, Mercedes had a 17 dexterity. These are old character sheets. They weren't completed at the time. So what I would do is I would use the two charisma rolls against each other, the 15 versus the 17. So I would have one character say, listen, I think we should kill everything in this whole area and then proceed. And the other character was saying, no, let's just continue looking for the abducted child. So it was two, they're at odds with each other. And the rest of the group is listening intently and trying to figure out who to follow. So what I would do is I'd make them make a charisma check. And what I would do is I'd roll a d20 for one and d20 for the other and they both got under their charisma number, that means they both believe in and have conviction for their point of view, but whoever had the lower role would be more persuasive in their argument, and the rest of the group would agree with that person. So in that situation, let's say you had a 15 charisma roll against a 17, the 17 charisma person rolled a 14, and the 15 charisma person rolled a two, the 15 charisma person would win because they underrolled under their ability. They, they flawlessly made their argument. So charisma is a neat statistic, and you'll see this is one thing I use a lot in the campaigns. I will use the ability scores to make judgment calls where the dice can kind of tell us what happens. 
because that's what they are. They're a score. They're telling us it's like you have a math test and how good are you at algebra or trigonometry or whatever? How good are you at the SAT? How good are you at this? How good are you at jogging? Your heart rate, your blood pressure, everything's a score. So the ability scores really help us determine like how much endurance someone has and things like that. So you've got that player's handbook, 999. You're flipping through it. You're reading. You look at this really old antiquated pictures. You realize some of these are actually quite good. Um, and then you start looking at things like class level limitations. Um, so once you get past those core statistics, things start getting a little muddy, um, but it's not that big of a deal. But a good thing to do is you can see right off the bat, this is all the classes in the first edition. So there's a cleric, and then a druid, a fighter, a paladin, ranger, magic user, illusionist, a thief, assassin, and a monk. One thing, a very subtlety for these old editions like this is paying attention to where the indentations are. So this is formatting on a typewriter, I kid you not. So notice how the druid is indented from the cleric. Notice how the paladin and the ranger are indented from the fighter, and the illusionist is indented from the magic user, and the assassin is indented from the thief. That's kind of like saying a specialized subclass, and that's essentially what they were. So we're going to we're going to stop here on this one, and the next episode is going to go through all the classes. And we'll talk about the subtleties of all these different classes: the cleric, the druid, the the fighter, the paladin, the ranger, the magic user, illusionist, and everything else. But before we go. Let me make sure I bring your attention to the other books. you got to have it. So you got your credit card out, and you're going to go buy a copy of the books. Besides the player handbook, which you can't miss it, looks like this is the classic version. The reprint version looks a little different. You definitely want to get a copy of the Dungeon Master's Guide. This is the really, really thick book that came out second. I think it came out third in 78. It has a lot of subtleties about some of these rules I'm talking about and gives you options. For example, it talks about infravision and ultravision and visibility and how does that work with this nice pencil sketch here. Or it talks about how you could detect things that are invisible. So, and how do you listen at a door and how does that rule work? It's really designed for the dungeon master. But for a player, if reading these rules lets you understand what you can and can't take advantage of. Um, one thing that we used to really, really enjoy about this was some of the subtleties of uh, combat, how combat worked, how treasure worked, how food worked, how defending flanks would work. It kind of felt like a complicated game. There was even modifiers for pursuing someone over different types of terrain. It got kind of bogged down with some uh, rules that kind of felt war gamey. So you just kind of selectively used the ones that really, really worked. Another thing about the uh, Dungeon Master's Guide, it would have these tables, the combat tables. So in the second edition, everything was oriented around a Thaco, which is to hit armor class zero. In first edition, you're looking up what it's good, the role to hit is, and it's a to beat role. Let's just look at this real quick. Let's say you're playing a level 10 druid, all right, or a level 10 monk. So you're level 10, so that goes between this range here, between 10 and 12, and you're trying to hit somebody in full plate male with a shield. You're gonna need this number right here. So you gotta beat the, you gotta beat a, a 12, okay? So in a D20, you need to roll a 12 or higher to hit and what that's implying is, and we'll talk about combat mechanics in other episodes, implying that over the course of a melee round with feints and parries and blocks and evasions and s slashing moves and stabs and lunges, that when you actually come to the moment of truth, you get your opportunity and you go for your swing and you go for your wound, your attack that's going to hurt the other, uh, hit the enemy, um, you got to beat that number to actually really pull it off, or it's completely deflected and nullified. So you either hit and do damage, which is also another range of uh, variables, or you do no damage at all and completely evaded the attack. So that's what the combat round went through. The Dungeon Master's guys where these things exist. Um, there's also a DM shield uh, that you can get as well that has this turned down to just a basic set of charts. Uh, there's the rolls for the monsters. Their numbers are higher. It's easier for them to hit you as well. So the DM's guide is the second book you should get. The first one's like creating characters and picking the spells and the, and the armor and the weapons and understanding the basic numbers. All the spells are really beautiful and fantastic. The DM's guys to start talking about details like, wow, I want to build my world. What's a, what's a mediocrity or hierarchy or gynarchy? Oh, I have never heard of that before. Or a theocracy, like that theocracy of pale. So you get a little bit of learning and going on here because this is all Gygax's world. They have a little sample dungeon. They even there's a section where it walks through what the DM says and how the players talk. So if you've never played before, even though this is really old school, goofy typewriter type setting content, uh, pick it up and read a page or two. You might be really excited to find out that some of the details are timeless, that they've never really changed over the years. You'll find descriptions of, of infamous magic items like the Girdle of Giant Strength or um, Gauntlets of Swimming or Gauntlets of Ogre Power. There's an entire section in the DM's Guide that goes through treasure, wands, artifacts, as a things you can roll on tables to determine additional treasure, 
minor powers. Really nice. Gets a little Traveler-esque. If you ever played Traveler and you're making a starship or roll up a, a space system, if you need to generate treasure and loot and you want to feel random, you can create side effects, all kinds of stuff. So the DM's Guide, going back to the original beginning here, the DM's Guide is a must-have. So you spent 10 bucks on one book and 10 bucks on the other one. The next one I highly recommend is the Monster Manual. The Monster Manual is full of all the enemies, the creatures, and, and things you're going to fight in the game. Um, some of the pictures are goofy. A lot of them are really, really good. But this is where the classic original descriptions of some of these things came from. Some of the pictures like this one are kind of goofy, but some ones down here by, I think it's a Trampier or a DSL picture, they're fantastic. The enemies, they, they'll give you the hit dice, which is like saying the level of the enemy. In fact, let's just look at this Carrion Crawler, our infamous character here. Three plus one hit dice. Now, in the other versions of the game, you may find a Carrion Crawler is like an eight hit dice monster. So it's different. It's balanced differently. This came first. So be sure to pay attention to that. Don't assume that a dragon is 25 hit dice because you played it in another version of the game. They usually give descriptions of what they do, what kind of magic resistance, how intelligent they are, just enough information for you. You can see there's four enemies in a page. I mean, it's not like there's one big, you know, photo, uh, beautiful color photograph spanning multiple pages. Even all the demons and dinosaurs and everything else is in here. So the Monster Manual is definitely the, another book you want to get. Uh, that's fun because if you start thinking about, oh, I'm going to make my own dungeon, my own world, ignore the terrible cover art. Uh, this is a good place to start getting ideas uh, for what kind of world could you create. So here's a quick example. Say you wanted to make, well, okay, say you wanted to make a giant themed dungeon adventure based on cloud giants. Well, a good place to start is just read this little description of them, what they do, where they like to live, how they work out, because cloud giants only infrequently appear in the in the giant series. So, you know, this kind of book, you think that's a good place, wait till you get to this one. The Fiend Folio was a collection of enemies and artwork done in the United Kingdom, and I think it's probably far superior to any of the ones done in the United States. They certainly made another one called the uh, Monster Manual 2, which is pretty good. Um, it's really nice, too. It has really good stuff. It's the same kind of quality of art. Um, some of it's a little bit better. Um, they have some new enemies that don't appear in the first Monster Manual. Most of them are ones that kind of popped up in some of the dungeons along the way. Um, some additional crazy demons and things like that. And These monsters like this. And some of the art's a little bit better. They're, it's good to have. Um, but I would tell you this. If I could pick just one book I would take this one and I think the reason why I love this one so much is when it first came out is the art is just gruesome the pictures in here are creepy and nasty um, they are not shy and vulnerable they're bold black and white sketches there's situations you know sketches are done from scenes from books the illumination the lighting in the map are really crazy these are bad guys you may recognize from one of the Dritt Stewart and books um, some of it looks like something from the Renaissance. Some of the enemies are just like this one here. Look at this character. It's just brilliantly done. This Crypt Thing monster. I mean, that's fantastic. The original introduction of the Gith Yankee and the Gith Zerai are in here. Um, really, 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 really good book. And the thing I always thought was very interesting about this book was when there were pictures of human characters. Like here's the, for Drow Elf. There's a great picture. I think there's a Willingham uh, picture done here. They usually had... Uh, kind of gruesome like a flend i mean these pictures are great for lauren fantastic really well done they would have kind of gruesome scenes scenes like this you know this is a gith yankee with a silver sword fighting a player the magic user and a thief who's freaking out in the background another gith yankee in the foreground and just the whole drawing technique i can't remember who this was is riggs or ross that did these they're just great i mean even the dungeon ceilings drawn there's another gith yankee in the background coming it's just like wow it's right out of a movie why the guy's wearing tennis shoes in the background here, I, I have no idea, right? <laughs> so definitely pick that one up. If you have to pick up any of the monster books, I really suggest you get the very, very first original one at a minimum and get the Fiend Folio as a second choice. You could skimp out and not get the Monster Manual 2. Just get it later. Get it your next paycheck. All right. I'll go on and on and on all night long. Let's, let's switch to another episode to talk about the character classes and the differences there. So now you know where to get the books. Go grab them. Start reading them. Um, you can print on demand them if you need to. Um, you could actually just print them on a copy machine and bind them together and have your own personal references, which is what I do a lot of times. Um, and be creative and have fun with it. And I uh, hope it's been a pretty good guy for you. And if you have any questions, leave questions uh, in the comments. I'll be happy to answer it. I like playing all editions. 
Um, but the reason why I started my whole campaign in the classic DM channel in first edition is because it's 40 years later. So it's kind of fun to go back in time and start it all back over from the beginning. And I think there's just so much classic unearthed magic in the original game that people don't know about. Uh, people have got into the game since fourth and fifth edition. And, uh, you know, someone that was 13 years old, that's 2004, and there was fourth edition came out two or three years later. They may have missed out on all this. So every edition is awesome, but this is definitely one, a very fun, cheap one to get started with. All right, we're going to stop there. In our next episode, we're going to talk about the character classes, what makes them special in first edition. Talk to you soon.